first of all, I'm very grateful for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm, I'm particularly grateful to the, to the International Arbitration Centre and everyone in the Arbitration Centre, Centre uh, starting with Mr. John Beachy and also to uh, my thanks to Francois Lassalle. Um, I will be looking today to Sub-Saharan Africa where a series of events which are currently taking place will no doubt have an impact in terms of generation of disputes related with international contracts, be it commercial arbitration or investment arbitration. What is happening today in Africa can be compared with what happened in Latin America 15 years ago, which is now a case study uh, both in commercial arbitration and international arbitration. I am talking not only about the effects, direct and indirect, that the Arab Spring had on foreign investment across Africa, but also the vol volatility in what concerns prices of commodities and the oil crisis which impacted countries largely dependent on the energy sector such as Nigeria and Angola. These countries had an average of 10% GDP growth per year dur during the first 10 years of the century. Uh, in one year, Nigeria, in one of the first 10 years of the century, Nigeria had a GDP growth of 30%. The slowdown in China affected the level of investment made abroad and forced local gov governments in Africa to find alternative sources of revenue. This is because China is now by far the largest foreign investor in Africa. Together with this, there is a huge demographic pressure and uh, the population of Africa will double to 2.4 billion inhabitants by 2050. All this put together with the context of massive inequality between a huge majority of people living beyond the poverty, poverty line and a small minority which is constantly trying to increase their personal wealth by using their position in the government or close to the power have as, as a result the creation of a perfect storm where the African governments and those near to it will try to change the status quo and increase the payout to be delivered by international investors, and international investors will, at the same time, try to resist as much as possible without jeopardizing the highly profitable businesses they have in Sub-Saharan Africa. When we talk about a region like Sub-Saharan Africa, we are talking about a huge territory with more than 40 countries out of the 54 countries in Africa. Each country has its particular context and situation, and in some cases we will find huge differences regarding political and economical systems within the same country. Also, we should consider the different maturities of each economy. Nigeria and Angola, for example, can be considered mature economies in terms of investment in energy resources, with ongoing oil projects for decades now. Opposite to this, Mozambique, Uganda and Kenya are newcomers in what concerns the energy sector, with recent significant discoveries of offshore and onshore reserves of natural gas and oil. The characteristics which come to mind when we think about Sub-Saharan Africa countries are political instability, economical volatility, weak rule of law, poor governance, and lack of trust in the domestic institutions, institutions, notably domestic courts. Like in any generalization, this may be unfair to a number of states in the region. Be it as it may, this is a region that investors cannot simply ignore in their increasingly demanding business plans. Challengingly and at the same time, the way to do business in Africa is quite different from what investors are used to in more mature markets. Investors can be faced with low angel and large scale corruption. Corruption may be present at the investment stage and throughout the investment period, notably in the form of facilitation payments, which in some kinds are key to secure the investment or to make sure that the investment is not jeopardized with forced delay, delays for the issuance of licenses or to obtain visas for the employees of the investors, for example. 
Although some of the African states are now giving important steps to tackle corruption, notably at the procurement front, this is still an endemic characteristic of some of these jurisdictions. And it represents quite an hurdle to uh, entities who need to comply with the US Foreign Corrupt, Act, uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act or the UK Bribery Act, uh, both of which include provisions with extraterritorial effects and which may lead to investigations of the Department of Justice and the Serious Fraud Office in connection with corruption acts practiced outside the US or the UK. Sorry. The low level of compliance with the rule of law, the constant change of the regulatory and legal background which constituted the background for investment decisions due to changes in government, for example, and the perception that even the domestic courts of some states are corrupt poses a series of questions to foreign investors in what concerns investment disputes. Mature investment investors know now that dispute settlement clauses should no longer be treated as midnight clauses. In our experience of negotiation of investment contracts, it is increasingly common to have long discussions about the structure of dispute mechanism clauses with investors seeking to avoid domestic courts and clauses provided for exhaustion of local remedies before submitting a dispute to arbitration. Investors demand more and more direct recourse to international arbitration with seat at a neutral fora. In order to avoid the cost of arbitrations, we also see an increasing tendency to submit technical disputes to experts or dispute adjudication boards. This happens because sophisticated investors are now very familiar with horror stories where in the absence of an effective dispute settlement mechanism, investors were materially expropriated of the investments or had to deal with abrupt changes of circumstances directly or indirectly imposed by the host states. However, it is still true that in same, some cases, the host states refuse to have their disputes submitted to international arbitration. I will now describe some current tendencies in what concerns dispute settlement of investment projects in sub-Saharan Africa, and then deal with the investment arbitration provisions of an organization called Southern African Development Community to demonstrate how some states are trying to avoid the applicability of bilateral investment treaties or multilateral investment treaties, with the larger tendency of it withdrawing from these treaties Similar, similar to the one we saw over the last decade in Latin America and giving a step back in terms of protection of foreign investments. So, disputes related with Africa represent an increasing portion of the disputes adjudicated in the international arbitration sphere. Most Probably the majority of these arbitrations are related with energy and natural resources of African jurisdictions. Mining, oil, and natural gas, gas are by far the usual suspects in terms of sectors where disputes are originated and the amounts at stake may be incredibly high. The economical volatility in what concerns utilities, in particular oil, and the black empowerment movements taking place in several African states gave rise to some patterns of behaviors by the governments of these states. On this respect, there are three patterns which are particularly visible. First, the indigenization of the economy. Second, the imposition of unforeseen tax measures. And third, the reinterpretation of contracts. In what concerns the first one, the indigenization of the economy, there is a strong movement from several African countries towards attributing historical, historically disadvantaged groups a higher degree of participation in the economy. This is very visible in countries like South Africa, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and Namibia, 
where the laws provide for minimum standards of black ownership requirements, which are affecting not only the negotiation of, of new contracts, and this is very, uh, very visible in Mozambique, which is now executing a number of contracts with foreign investors as a result of a discovery of massive offshore natural gas reserves, but also existing contracts. In what concerns existing contracts, there are two well-known investment arbitration cases over the last year where the focus of the discussion was exactly the implementation of black economic empowerment regimes. The first, the first one was an exit arbitration filed by a group of investors from Italy and Luxembourg against South Africa after the publication of the Mining and Petroleum Resources Development Act in 2004 which included a provision requiring that all the mining companies should achieve at least a 26% ownership by historically disadvantaged, disadvantaged South Africans. This is the Foresti case. In 2006, a group of, citizen, of Italian citizens and the Luxembourg company that they owned launched an investment arbitration against South Africa under the BITs with Italy and Luxembourg, claiming that this measure should be deemed as an indirect expropriation and therefore presented the claim of almost $400 million. South Africa sustained that the implemented measures were reasonable and legitimate given the objectives of the legal reform and their impact in the st stabilization of the country, and also that the legislation allowed investors to carry on alternative beneficiation measures with impact in South Africa economy which should allow them to strongly decrease the 26% stake to be transferred to historically disadvantaged people. The claimants eventually discontinued the proceedings because they were able to implement beneficiation measures which had as in fact the actual reduction of the stake to be transferred from 26 to 5 percent. Another much debated case and particularly violent was the one launched by the Van Pazel family and their companies against Zimbabwe under the BIT with between Zimbabwe and Germany and the BIT between Zimbabwe and Switzerland. This case dealt with the implementation of the land reform in Zimbabwe in 2005, from 2005 onwards, and the resistance offered by the Van Pezold family against the expropriation of three highly, profit, highly profitable farms they had in the country. The violent acts surrounding this case led the arbitral tribunal to issue orders, interim orders, against the state of Zimbabwe, forcing the state to implement security measures to avoid one of the members of the Van Pezold family from being killed. The case ended with the condemnation of Zimbabwe to the restitution of the farms. So these are two good examples of facts around the first tendency I've identified. Moving now to the second tendency to be highlighted, it's the one related with the change to tax legislation, notably through the creation of windfall profit taxes and capital gain taxes. Windfall profit taxes are taxes which are imposed, are extraordinary taxes which are imposed by a country in case of an unexpected increase of revenues by the investor. And the capital gain taxes is the capital gain taxes as in any country in the world. A particular good example of threatened arbitration on this regard was the one involving Mozambique, which imposed in some cases retroactively capital gain taxes to investors even when the deals which had been made occurred between foreign holding companies which had stakes at the operational level in Mozambique. So the companies where the sale was being made were uh, their headquarters and the place of execution of the contract was outside Mozambique. A good example of this was a case involving Rio Tinto, one of the largest mining companies in the world. Rio Tinto bought coal mines back in 2011 to Riversdale by an amount of $4 billion. A few years later, and considered, considering what happened meanwhile with the price of coal, Rio Tinto sold these same mines to an Indian investor by less than 100 million US dollars. So, 4 million to 100 million in roughly three years.
The Mozambican tax authorities not only tried to charge capital gains tax for the initial sale made by Riversdale in an offshore jurisdiction, but also they tried to impose that to the buyer of those stakes, to Rio Tinto, who had just sell the, 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 the same stakes with a huge uh, loss. The case was particularly dramatic because Rio Tinto was already selling the mines at a highly discounted price, less than 2% of the acquisition price. This was not the only case where the Mozambican state tried to charge capital gains tax, but to the best of my knowledge, all cases were settled without recourse to arbitration, even the Rio Tinto case. Other countries such as Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania are following similar approaches in what concerns the imposition of higher tax burdens to investors. <coughs> The third and last tendency I would like to refer to before talking about the SADC protocol is what has been euphemistically called as reinterpretation of existing contracts, taking place in countries with more mature economies, which are more concerned in obtaining additional funds from existing projects than they are to attract new investments. This often happens in moments when the investor requires additional licenses to proceed from the development stage of the project to the production stage, and where some states take the opportunity to impose new conditions in terms of revenue split to the investors by means of alleged reinterpretations of contracts, particularly in what concerns the provisions regarding deductible costs for extraction of oil. This happened in Nigeria with a number of well-known disputes between some of the largest oil companies in the world and the, uh, the Nigerian National Oil Agency, the, NNAP, the NNPC, and is happening as we speak in another large African jurisdiction. It is with this scenario in mind that I now move to analyze the investment protection provisions of this organization called Southern Africa Development Community, which is an organization created in 1993 with the aim of promoting sustainable and equitable economic growth and socioeconomic development to consolidate and maintain democracy, peace, security, and stability, and to promote integration in the region. This organization covers 15 members, and it goes from um, South Africa to Congo and from Angola to Mauritius. So the, the territory which is covered is more than half of Africa. For the purposes of this session, I'm particularly interested in one of the protocols adopted by the SADC, the Protocol on Investment and Finance, signed on August 2006 and entered in force in April 2010. This protocol seeks to foster harmonization, and I'm quoting, of the financial and investment policy of the state parties in order to make them consistent with the objectives of SADC by creating a favorable investment climate within SADC with the aim of promoting and attract investments in the region. In order to achieve these objectives, the protocol contains one annex affording investors special protection on their investment, in, investments, similar to the provisions which one can find in BITs, including protection against expropriation, ensuring fair and equitable treatment, and repatriation of investments and returns. Under this annex, the enforcement of the investment protection provision will be made by arbitration, submitted alternatively to one of three or four fora. First, the SADC tribunal, a tribunal which is exclusive to the organization. Second, the exit rules or the exit additional facility rules, second and third. And third, ad hoc arbitration under the UNCITRAL rules. Importantly, parties can only resort to arbitration after they have exhausted local remedies and after a six-month cooling-off period. My purpose in this session is not to address the substantive protection of the, the protocol, nor the intricacies of the concept of investment under this treaty, 
My objective today is simply to assess to what extent can this tool be used by investors in a region where some of the countries have a very limited number of BITs, or in some cases are withdrawing from the BITs, like it happened with South Africa after the Foresti case. The most relevant features of this protocol, the most important feature of this protocol is, in my view, its definition of investor. According to Article 1 of the Annex, an investor must be a person, and I'm quoting, a person that has been admitted to make an investment or has made an investment. The specificity of this provision and its added value to foreign investors is that, on its face, there is no requirement whatsoever for the investment to be made by an investor of one of the contracting states. Put it differently, the element of attraction of applicability of the protocol seems to be the investment by itself and not the nationality of the investors. If this is correct, this means that any investors in this territory, independently from its origin or nationality, will be entitled to make use of this relevant tool in case his or her investment is affected by measures which are captured, captured by the investment protection provisions of the protocol. I should, however, highlight that to the best of my knowledge, this interpretation of the protocol has not yet been test, tested until now, although there is a doctrine defending, uh, constantly defending this interpretation. But this is not the only hurdle that uh, investors will be faced with in case they want to resort to, to arbitration under the protocol. Following a decision from 2000, in 2007 in the infamous Mike Campbell versus Zimbabwe case, where the SADC tribunal considered that the land reform program of Zimbabwe represented not only a denial of justice, but also a racially discriminatory measure, there were another 10 decisions rendered by the same tribunal against the state of Zimbabwe. As a consequence of this, and in a typical protective movement from the contracting states, they decided to prevent the SADC tribunal from deciding new cases and decided to replace all the members of this tribunal. This happened in May 2011 at an extraordinary summit of the heads of state of the SADC and had as effective effect the suspension of the tribunal. Now, the question is about the impact of this measure on the overall investment prote protection mechanism provided in the protocol. It is true that the SADC tribunal is no longer an option for investors, but it is also true that the rich arbitration clause contained in the protocol provides for other options to investors, including exit and ad hoc arbitration. To the best of my knowledge, these provisions have not yet been tested, and, but they have not been revoked. And there is room, significant room in my view, to argue that these options are still available to any investor in sub-Saharan Africa. We do know that Zimbabwe refused to comply with the arbitration awards rendered uh, against the country by the SADC tribunal, and we assume that if and when an investor resorts to exit or ad hoc arbitration, Zimbabwe is likely to resist again the, uh, against the jurisdiction of such a, tri a tribunal and resist against enforcement at a later stage. However, this does not mean that investors should not resort to this important tool, particularly if they are if they have no other tools available. In those circumstances, I submit, investors may well launch exit or ad hoc arbitration and test the tribunal's jurisdiction under the protocol for investment and finance. In case they are su successful, it is likely that investors will be left with the option of enforcing the arbitral award in countries outside the SADC region or at least outside the respondent ter territory. But this is by far the best option they have. Thank you very much. Thank you.